Hare Krishna. Welcome to Bhakti Sangha Chappa Conference Call. Today we are very fortunate to have His Holiness Chandra Mali Swami Maharaj. So Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Maharaj. So thank you so much Maharaj for giving your valuable association and time. So now I would like to hand over the call to you Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Yes. Please put up the verse for today. Okay. So. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So this is from Fourth Canto. Chapter 29, verse number 66. Mana eva manusya syaha, urva rupani samsati, bhavishyatas cha bhadram te, taiva nam bhavishyataha. Translation. So Narada Muni, still speaking to King Pachini Barhishat, or Pachini Barmu. O king, <clears throat> all good fortune unto you. The mind is the cause of the living entity attaining a certain type of body in accordance with his association with material nature. According to one's mental composition, one can understand what the living entity was in his past life, as well as what kind of body he will have in the future. Thus the mind indicates the past and future bodies <clears> to <throat> the robe by purple. The mind is the index of information about one's past and future lives. Hmm. So here it's an interesting statement. Index. Index means reference. And something that is available upon investigation. So when we have an index of information, we keep it available. And if we need something from that index, we go to it. Um, so in the same way, the mind uh, keeps all of one's past experiences, uh, activities, emotions, uh, everything that we have experienced in all our lives since the time the living entity accepted a material body in the material world. Mind can be divided into two categories of itself. One is the conscious mind, and one is the unconscious mind. The, the conscious mind is what we are dealing with moment to moment. Uh, so in the conscious mind, I'm not reading, I'm just speaking now. <laughs> in the conscious mind, um, we see what is in front of us, in other words, what is up on our me mental screen. But we can understand, and a computer would be a good example, is just like a computer has so much information. But what you see up on the screen is just one part of that small information. But we know behind, within the hard drive, in the, the categories of the South software, there are unlimited amounts of information there. We don't, we're not aware of it until we bring it up. So in the same way, the unconscious mind is the bigger part of the mind. And that unconscious mind is what moves us from life to life, birth after birth, according to our desires and activities that have been accumulated from th this life and in previous lives. Okay. So Prabhupada goes on, if a man is a devotee of the Lord, he cultivated devotional service in his previous life. Similarly, if one's mind is criminal, he was criminal in his last life. In the same way, according to the mind, we can understand what will happen in the future life. The word is said in the Gita, Urvam gachiti sattvastar madhyam tishtani rajasaha. 
Jagannan Guna Vritta Sta Aho Gachanti Tavasaha. So here, those who are situated in the mode of goodness gradually go up to the higher planets. Those in the mode of passion live on the earth, and those in the mode of ignorance go to the hellish world. So according to our mental state, we are projected in a certain activity, and that activity projects us in a certain atmosphere. If a person is in the mode of goodness, his mental activities will promote him to higher planetary systems, okay? If he's in the low mentality, his future life will be abominable. So you can see the how the mind directs everything. Whoops. The lives of the living entity in both the past and future are indicated by one's mental condition. Hmm. There are those who can simply tell by a, a person's mind who they were in their last life and what they're doing in this life. Narada Muni is here in offering the king's blessings of all good fortune so the king will not desire anything or make plans for sense gratification. I can't see the word, it's covered. Uh, go down a little bit. My name is in the middle. Yeah. Uh, the king was engaged in fruit of ritualistic act ceremonies because he hoped to get a better life in the future. So, we're planning to get better situations in the future by what we do in the present. Narada Muni desired him to give up all mental concoctions. Why? All bodies in the heavenly and hellish arise from mental concoctions. In other words, uh, just like we see in dreams sometimes where you'll see all kinds of strange things that don't, do not make any sense to you, it's just that these we've experienced these different uh, different features of the dream at different times in our waking life, and then in the dream state they're thrown together, and a lot of times they simply don't make sense. All the bodies in the heavenly planet are arise from mental concoctions, and the sufferings and enjoyments of material life are simply on the mental platform. They take place on the chariot of the mind called Mano Rita. Yashyasti Bhakti Bhagavati Akinchana Survai Gunas Tatra Sasam Samastu Say Sura. Arava Bhaktas Kuto Mahaguna Mano Ratena Sati Dayato Bahi. One who has unflinching devotion for the personality of Godhead has all good qualities of the demigods. One who is not a devotee of the Lord has only material qualifications that are part of the little, little value. This is because he is hovering on the mental plane and is certain to be attracted by the glaring material energy. Unless one becomes a devotee of the Lord or becomes fully Krishna conscious, he will certainly hover on the mental platform and be promoted and degraded in different types of bodies. All qualities that are considered good according to material estimation actually have no value because these so-called good qualities will not save a person from the cycle of birth and death. The conclusion is that one should be without mental desire. One should be fully free from material desires philosophical speculation, and fruit of activities. The best course for a human being is to have favorably accepted transcendental devotion in the service of the Lord. This is the highest perfection of life. Om Gyan Timidandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Sri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Nupa Kadamayam Padati Swam Padati Kami. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Namade. Namaste Saraswati Deve. Gaudavani Pacharini Vishishu Shunyavadi. Pasyatya De Satarine. Panchakopa Thru Bischa Kripasindu Pae Bacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namaha. 
Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasri Gaur Bhaktavinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, <coughs> Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So here, Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter, Krishna gives a very detailed explanation of the nature of the mind and uh, the importance of controlling the mind and directing the mind in devotion. Uh, in one place, he says, the mind is the best friend of the living entity <clears throat> or the worst enemy. He says, one should elevate themselves by the mind, not degrade themselves. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. So we have our best friend and our worst enemy sitting right alongside of us. It's called the mind. <laughs> The mind is a composition of emotions, desires, thoughts, impressions, feelings, everything that we've experienced in previous lives, uh, hidden away in the index of the mind or the unconscious part of the mind. According to what we desire in this life, we find that that is what becomes our mental focus, like that. So we direct the mind according to what we want to achieve in life. Yeah. So the mind is part of the subtle body. The mind is not the soul. <clears throat> the mind is influenced. The soul is influenced by the impressions of the mind and is dragged along with the mind to material activities. Uh, the soul has nothing to do with the mind but the soul is connected to the mind through the activities of the mind, senses, and the intelligence. Uh, it's almost like a, a person sitting on the chariot, that is the example, and being dragged by the horses. The horses are the five senses, the reins are the mind, the driver is the intelligence, and the passenger is the soul, the chariot is the body. You can put that image in your mind and you can see that uh, the senses are pulling the mind in a certain direction and the, mind, and the intelligence is trying to direct the mind, the mind and senses like that. So we have to have some direction in life. And of course, all material directions in life simply compound the attachments that are found within our life and keep us on the mental platform. Mental platform means rejecting and accepting based on likes and dislikes like that. <laughs> One who is controlled by the mind is called Godas. One who, is called, who controls the mind is called Goswami. Go means mind, Swami means controller, Das means servant. And so those who are controlling the mind means they're directing the mind to their ultimate benefit in life, which is to awaken our natural loving propensity to, lo to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead, like that. But the mind is very tricky, and the mind has been with us for millions of births. We have the same mind that we've had when we first came to the material existence, only now it is more compounded with the experiences of our lives with our many millions and millions of lives, hidden away in the unconscious part of the mind. <laughs> so, uh, um, therefore, the, the main principle in spiritual practice is to control the mind and not be controlled by the mind. Controlling the mind comes in three different ways. Prabhupada describes these three ways as ways to control the mind. One is to meditate on the instructions of the spiritual master. To keep the instructions of the spiritual master foremost in all of one's activities. And that is the main way. Prabhupada gives up something similar as another way to control the mind. Stay engaged in devotional service. In other words, one is uh, using all of one's time to serve the Lord 
in different ways, chanting the holy names, reading Srimad Bhagavatam, associating with devotees, taking Krishna Prashadam, worshiping the Lord in, our diff in his different forms, and engaging in practical service activities. All these are directed by the instructions of the spiritual master. Therefore, one who can learn the art of keeping the mind connected to spiritual activities all the time will eventually reach the spiritual platform, free from the, what we say, difficulties that the minds will impose. But still, the mind is very strong. And especially when we go into dreams, when we go sleeping at night, a lot of time the mind takes the soul into different places throughout the universe in previous experiences, in previous lives, or in, in this life. And so one has to very carefully control the mind and the waking state. And therefore, when it comes to taking rest, when the mind is in more or less a, what they call, it's called the swapna state. Swapna means dreaming. There are three phases of the mind's existence, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. Waking, we are familiar with. Dreaming, we also know. Deep sleep means that they're beyond the state of dreaming. The mind is in a restful state. And although it's still active, one cannot perceive uh, what are the activities of the mind on that level of, of activity. These are the three states. Prabhupada also mentions the third reason how to control the mind, which is a little bit of a combination of of material activities, and that is to work for the benefit of others. He mentions that also, to work for the good of others. Of course, he says working for the good of others means taking up Krishna consciousness and preaching Krishna consciousness for the benefit of others. But even in a general sense, when one is working for the benefit of other people, then their minds are controlled and generally they are happy. So these are uh, ways that the mind has to be controlled. Um, we find throughout the scriptures how difficult it is mentioned. We have the story of Judd Bart and how he was trying to serve the king. But we have the story of Judd Bart before he actually became Judd Bart when he was Bart Maharaj. He was living in the forest. He was um, on the very high platform of spiritual practice. He had reached the stage of uh, bhava and he was uh, living in a very secluded woodsy life in the forest doing prayers and meditations, finishing out his existence. He had been king of the world and now he had retired from that, finishing out in his spiritual activities. While he was in the forest, he happened to see an experience where one little one deer was pregnant and one lion came by and roared very loudly and it frightened the deer. The deer jumped over the river or over a stream and when she jumped, uh, her baby fell out of her body and the mother died out of fear. The little baby now was all alone. Judd Bart thought, oh, the baby is without its mother. So he took care of the deer and he, he became pretty much like the sole, sole caretaker of the deer. So much so that he forgot all his other activities and centered his whole life on taking care of his deer. In taking care of this deer, he actually started to develop genuine affection for the deer. And then, of course, at the time of death, he thought of the deer and in his next life, he took birth as a deer. So his mind got diverted away from his spiritual activities and developed affection for this animal. There was nothing wrong in taking care of the deer but he became so infatuated with that 
that he left all his other spiritual activities. And you can, you, as you read within that description, how much he was actually practically like the mother of the deer in the real sense of the term. So one has to be very careful in how to direct the mind through attachment, through aversion, and through affection, one becomes entangled in this material world like that. If we develop material affection for our family members, material, not spiritual, material affection based on the body, and at the time of death, if we leave the body thinking of our family members, then again, we will take birth again to again begin our last life attachment. Prabhupada describes how a person may be so attached to their house and that, that when they die, they think of that house that they built and lived in. And in the next life, because they're not qualified to receive a material, a, a human body, they take birth in the house as a cockroach or some kind of creature in the house. So um, the mind has to be very carefully controlled. A slight deviation in mental activity can cause one to lose so many lifetimes of progress in the, in the in spiritual practice. So one has to be very, very, very careful. Careful. We have the example of an Ajamil, Brahmin boy, trained in Brahminical culture, had a nice wife, very dutiful in his Brahminical du duties, walking along the street one day. He saw a sight that was quite unusual for that for that for those times. A Sudrani and a Sudra embracing in a very affectionate way in public. And they were both intoxicated. His mind became attracted so much so that he actually pursued a life with that prostitute. So that little deviation in mind uh, caused him to give up everything spiritual and take to a degraded materialistic existence. So the mind has to be, and the best way to control the mind is, as we mentioned, uh, to engage it in devotional service. But one of the best ways within devotional service is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. If we're always chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, then the mind is in the best position. Keeping one's focus on the sound vibration, one is in spiritual meditation, and then that mind is actually elevating one to the spiritual platform. Like that. But we see the Subari Muni, another example, a little deviation in mind, and he gave up all his austerities and became, uh, got married to so many ladies and became a materialistic householder. So yeah, the mind, as we say, is chanchala. Chanchala hi mana krishna pramati balabhadriha tasyaham niganam manye vayorida saduskaram. Uh, Arjuna mentions this verse, or this, he speaks to Krishna. He says, you're asking me to control the mind. I think, my dear Krishna, you're asking me to control the wind. It's more difficult to control mind than it is to control the wind. And Krishna uh, agrees with all his statements, but then he says, Abhyasena tu kontaya vairagyana chigriyate. He says, by, uh, co by constant practice, this is the important part, one has to constantly practice keeping that mind in the, the, the right direction, in the spiritual direction and giving up the attachment to material sense gratification simultaneously, one can start to control the restless mind. Chanchala. Chanchala means flickering. Uh, sometimes there is, a, we give that name to a prostitute. A prostitute is also known as 
Pumshali, Pumshali, means he jumps from one person to another, like lightning goes from one cloud to another. So the word chanchala means flickering, going from one situation to another, to another, to another, to another. Dragging the, ma dragging the senses, dragging the intelligence, dragging the soul into different features of material existence. Like that. So one has to be aware of the workings of the mind. In the story of Judd Bart, there's a nice, uh, uh, what's the word? There's a nice uh, way that Prabhupada says how to control the mind. Um, this is in the, we can bring this verse up if you have. It's the uh, fifth canto, 11th chapter. The last verse in the chapter, verse number 17, 5, 11, 17. Let's just explore this particular verse. And the last verse, verse number 17. Okay. Vitru eva, okay. Brit ram enam. Okay. This uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. If one neglects it or gives it a chance, it will grow more and more powerful and become victorious. Although it is factual, factual, it is not real. It covers the constitutional position of the soul. O oh, king, please try to conquer this mind by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spiritual master and the supreme personality of Godhead. Do this with great care. So uh, Judd Bard is speaking to King Rahugana. And then Prabhupada's first line in the purport is quite interesting. There is one easy weapon with which the mind can be conquered, neglect. The mind is always telling us to do this or do that. Therefore, we should be very expert in disobeying the mind's order. Yeah. Um, just like I'll give you an example. Sometimes we see in the family, there's a little child. Maybe one and a half, two years old, running around the house. And sometimes it runs up to the mother and starts asking for this, that, that, and this. And then it runs away, goes this way, that way. And so <clears throat> the, mo the mother uh, is, got, is busy doing her chores. So after a while, she just thinks, well, I'm not going to pay attention to him. Let him do whatever he wants to do there. And she goes one on for chores. Mm -hmm. So when the child starts seeing the mind is the mother's not listening, he stops bothering the mother. So gradually the mind can be trained to obey the orders of the soul. So we have to be very expert in disobeying the mind's orders when the mind's orders take us away from our real business in life or from our best interests. And then Prabhupada goes on to, go, to explain how his spiritual master gave a little indication or a little uh, formula for controlling the mind. He said one should learn to beat the mind with shoes many times before an awakening and again going to sleep. Actually, in another place, he says, beat the mind with shoes when you wake up and beat the mind with broomstick just before you go to rest. The nature of the mind is it is restless and it can, is very difficult to control. So the best way to control the mind is always keep the mind connected to the spiritual platform through the instructions of the spiritual master and the activities of devotional service. And we highly recommend that one chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra as much as possible that will help one to control the mind and engage the mind in the right way. 
So don't become discouraged. The mind can be really very formidable. Although it says here, the mind is very formidable, but it's not real. It's just a covering over the soul. That's all. But one has to practice. And in another place it says, don't make friends with the mind. Always learn to mistrust your mind. If you make friends with your mind, and it's explained in the next chapter, I think, no, I'm sorry, not, not in the next chapter, but in the uh, fifth canto, in the sixth chapter, there's a series of verses, verses three, four, five, six, that if you make friends with the mind, the mind can cheat you at any moment. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, here, yeah, these verses here. Can someone read them? My voice is getting a little strained. Somebody can read these four verses, or at least a, three verses, three, four, and five. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. Please obeys the Shri Prabhupada. Can I read? Yeah. Thank you. Nice and loud. Um, all the learned scholars have given their opinion. The mind is by nature very restless and one should not make friends with it. If we place full confidence in the mind, it may cheat us at any moment. Even Lord Shiva became agitated upon seeing the Mohini form of Lord Krishna and so Parimuni also fell down from the major stage of yogic perfection. Text 4. An unchaste woman is very easily carried away by paramours, and it sometimes happens that her husband is violently killed by her paramours. If the yogi gives his mind a chance and does not restrain it, his mind will give facility to enemies like lust, anger, and greed, and they will doubtlessly kill the yogi. Text. The mind is the root cause of lust, anger, pride, greed, lamentation, illusion, and fear. Uh, combined, these constitute bondage to the fruitive, fruitive, fruitive activity. Sorry. What learned, what learned man would put faith in the mind. Yeah, so that's the idea, not putting faith in the mind because the mind is filled with all these uh, uh, anarthas. You One might think, well, my mind is okay. <laughs> if you think like that, you're in trouble. <laughs> Even if you were devoting for so many years, still, the mind is still hiding so many of the bad qualities and many of the times it will appear just out of nowhere and all of a sudden you're wondering how did I get here? What has caused that? So therefore one should always take good association with devotees and keep the mind in the mood of detachment and of devotion. Detachment from material things, devotion to the Supreme Lord like that. One has to very carefully and consistently practice controlling the restless mind. Otherwise, the mind, you can practice Krishna consciousness for 40 years and very be very much engaged in devotional service. One slight deviation in the mind can throw all the way, all your advancement down the drain. <clears throat> We see that sometimes uh, we hear examples, especially people in the material world. And they're very popular their whole life. They worked hard, became famous, became uh, expert in many things, were known for so many things. Somehow or other, one little slight deviation. And all of a sudden, boom. Their whole career is gone. Their whole life is destroyed just by a little bit of a deviation. Many years ago, this was a sad situation. 
It wasn't with a devotee. Of course, there are many examples of devotees also, but there was one very, very, very popular comedian who was practically the most popular co comedian on the main stages around the world. Uh, he would pack in audiences, hundreds and hundreds of people would come for his, his performance telling very funny jokes. And uh, he was also known as a great father in the family. So much so, he was very, very popular, very much loved by everyone, even the most prestigious people in society would come and hear from him. But one day he committed suicide. <laughs> I shocked the whole world, practically. This happened a few years ago, back in July of 2018, I believe, in 2017. Robin Williams, his name was. <clears throat> so here's a person who apparently externally had everything, but he didn't have Krishna. <laughs> and so you can't satisfy the mind through material things. It's never satisfying. The only way the mind can be satisfied and controlled is by devotional service to the Lord. Then the mind can become peaceful. And even if one does not have everything material or even the basic needs in material life, one can be peaceful simply because the mind is connected outside of the three modes of material nature, above the three modes, onto the spiritual fiber. So one should diligently, from the time one wakes up in the morning, the first thing you do when you wake up, you think of Krishna, you chant the holy names, you offer your obeisances to your spiritual master, and you remember your worshipful deity, and that way you begin the day with the, in the right mental state, and then you keep that consciousness throughout the day. We have to do so many things, and therefore our mind is diverted to the tasks that we are required to perform. Well, one should always remember Krishna at the same time, or remember that all of these activities are meant to elevate us to the spiritual platform and not degrade us. But this is a great subject. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books written about the mind, the nature of the mind, how to control the mind, what is the mind. And as Prabhupada said, <clears throat> uh, uh, there's only one enemy, the uncontrolled mind. Prahlad Maharaj also said that. When his father, Rani Kasipu, was chastising him because Prahlad had been glorifying Lord Vishnu. His father said, you're taking, uh, you're, you're taking sides with my enemy. Vishnu is my enemy. Prahlad Maharaj said, this idea of friends and enemies is simply mental concoction. Your own mind is your own enemy, my dear father. So we have to make the mind your friend and don't allow the mind to destroy our spiritual life or even our material uh, activities by uh, taking us into realms that we don't know. So therefore one has to, as it says in the Shastras, one has to carefully watch the workings of the mind. What is my mind doing now? Um, you want watch your mind. Sometimes you see, you start daydreaming and your mind drifts off and it gets into some thoughts that you shouldn't be thinking of. And then you start to realize you're in the wrong consciousness. So the mind will sneak off. The mind is very tricky. The mind is very subtle. The mind is very chanchala, always moving, doesn't stay in one place at all for any amount of time. Keep that mind connected to the lotus feet of the Lord in devotion. Survive, what is that verse? Uh, 
Why poon sum for all? No, no, that's that's not the words. Um, by kunta gunar nagar nanam manas manas manacharanam. Well, we verse spoken by by um, Ambarish Maharaj. What is that verse? Tavai manas Krishna padara vindayo vachamsi vai kunta gunanu varnani. Hey. Yeah, translation. <laughs> Uh, the mind should always be engaged in uh, Ambarish Maharaj engaged his mind in uh, thinking about the lotus feet of the Lord, his uh, words in glorifying um, uh, the Lord's qualities, um, his hands in uh, mopping the temple, his legs in going to the pilgrimage um, uh, to the temples and uh, yeah, his his uh, ears for hearing the glories of the Lord, tongue for speaking the glories of the Lord, his hands for massaging the bodies of the devotees, many things. So we have to practice. Mind control doesn't come simply by uh, one's trying to do it. One has to practice to control the mind. And as Krishna says, learning how to detach oneself from all materialistic thoughts and activities like that. Okay. Well, this verse is nice. It describes how he used all his senses, starting with the mind, in the service of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So it sounds a little difficult, but through practice, and that practice will elevate our consciousness in association with Krishna in the spiritual realm. So practice, practice, practice. Uh, most of us are householders. We have duties. We have jobs. Still, we must keep very strong sadhana. And that way, if we keep strong sadhana, even when we are away from our direct devotional activities, taking care of uh, our occupational duty, our minds will not be uh, affected or deviated by materialistic responsibilities. Okay, so we'll stop there and see, we'll open it up for questions. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Please accept the humble obeisances. Oh, Pariksit. Very well, Pariksit Ji, my obeisances. <laughs> oh, there you have wow, what a, what, a, what, a, what a surprise to see you. I'm so happy. <laughs> I just found out about oh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I realized this was a consistent thing that Sanamara Swami will come on on Fridays. And Friday, and Friday. Oh, okay. Well, I better join there. So this time. Okay. Right. <laughs> so we yeah. Have Thank you. Can, can you turn up your turn up your volume a little bit? It's a little too soft. Okay. Oops. Is it better? I'm not so. Not much. Okay, I'll just see. Is it better? Does it sound better? Ah, you got it. Okay, so it was the headphones I was doing. Okay, now that's out of the way now. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, you were saying that. I mean, you were instructing us that the mind is is ultimately the problem if we're having mm -hmm. issues. You know, it's not other things. But some people would say, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, admittedly. Some people will criticize others or even gossip about others, and they will say that what they are talking about is true. You know, the criticism is true, even they won't relate it. They won't relate the problem to their own minds. They will say it's somebody else. That's the problem. When they criticize that person. So what advice should we give, or even myself, I get caught up in that situation, how do I get out of it? Now that I know that it, it could be my, my own fault. Uh-huh. Well, you mean pushing the blame onto someone else, even though it appears to be obvious. Exactly, yeah. It's not important. If something's happening to us, we can understand that there's some lesson that we can learn from that, that we can grow from that, that we can become more attached to Krishna through these uh, trials and tribulations. 
uh, finding fault with others means to deviate one's best interest. Um, um, fault finder is simply a disturbed mind, that's all. That's all. If there is some fault in the other person, it's not important. Something not it's not important to dwell on that. And therefore, it says that when when one one should see the good qualities and the faults of another side by side and focus on their good qualities. And if apparently somebody has done something, and it's obviously that it's caused us some problems in life, sometimes we might use our intelligence to avoid that association. But uh, there's no need to. Um, uh, to, uh, you know, ex uh, exude all negativity, because negativity hurts the one who carries the negativity, even less than the person who is being directed. So, uh, the scriptures give us so many reasons why fault finding actually deviates our consciousness and takes us away from, uh, what we say, Hearing and chanting nicely the glories of the Lord. So we find sometimes when we sit down in the morning and chant our japa, that's when our mind starts coming up with all the problems of life. <laughs> so that's the time you have to really, as Bhakti Siddhanta Sir said, uh, become very strong in controlling the mind and force the mind to hear and chant until the mind actually starts to surrender to the holy name. Like that. And uh, avoid negative thoughts. Always think in terms of how best to serve others and how best I can, I can make advancement in my own spiritual life. Uh, do everything in the practical way, in the best possible way, and spend and um, use time for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. The world is full of faults. And, and every, it's easy to find faults in others. Very easy. It's just natural. In this age, is Kali Yuga. It's an ocean of faults. Kalodosha Nidhi Raja. It's full of faults. So, but that just take, deviates our consciousness and makes us, uh, what we say, unhappy. We don't find happiness in that kind of consciousness. Okay. And if somebody's disturb, disturbing you too much, just avoid that association. That's, that's practical. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hari well, I remember, I remember my last trip to, uh, to Harrisburg. <laughs> We also have Zoom now, but Ansi is handling that, and I'll let him know that you're on. And maybe if you, you don't mind, um, arrange for if you give a class also. If, if you have programs regularly in your Zoom program, there, um, I'm available for a class at any given time. So you can just contact, uh, send me an email, and then I'll. I send it to my uh, assistant, and then he'll make all arrangements for that. It's if you want to. Oh, definitely. And she would love it. She wants, there's two spots now she hasn't filled yet, and she's doing it herself. So she wants one person. If I tell her that you said you'd do well, at least one of them, she'd absolutely be thrilled. I know that already. <laughs> so I'm okay. going to her. So I will let her know. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. My obeisances to you and, and best wishes to the family. Mm, Rick. Rick. Vishaka is behind me, moving around. You probably see him uh, in the kitchen area. Okay, Rick. You can say, okay. can you say hi to Can you watch around? Just come a little closer. Okay. You can come around? Yeah, okay. Come, come in the camera. Come on, the camera. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I can't see you. I can only see. Your face down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you okay. Go. There you go. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. We're missing. We're missing. Your. We're missing the association of your whole family. <laughs> well, my eyes probably gonna be on on Zoom with us. And when I tell mom, yeah, yeah.
So and you're on Zoom, the other one, right? Okay, yeah, she's on the other the, the Harrisburg Zoom now. That's why she had the headphones on. So um, we definitely we we'll, we'll arrange something for sure. Okay, no thank you. No one refuse. Okay, I All right, thank you so much. So lucky. <laughs> Christmas mercy. Now we get you on there too. Ooh, we love it. <laughs> hey, Krishna. Anyway, let me not stop. Somebody else might want to ask a question. So. Anyone else for questions? <laughs> Where's our host? <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for giving a valuable association and for the wonderful session, Maharaj. Thank you so much. So I will request devotees if they have any questions or they want to share any realizations, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. How glorious to Shla Prabhupada. Yes, so thank you so much, Maharaj, for beautiful class. Uh, you were mentioning in the class, Maharaj, uh, when uh, we have to see our self-interest, uh, means uh, we can avoid the mind in that way, but sometimes we don't realize what is our real interest, and then we're just overing in the mind. Uh, how we can, I mean, uh, uh, go more in our self-interest? Through chanting. <laughs> if we chant more and more, we'll start, everything becomes easy and clear. <laughs> everything becomes more natural. And we can avoid those thoughts and impressions of the mind that are not conducive to our spiritual or material well-being. So we highly recommend that the best form of mind control is chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Thank you so much, Thank you so much, Thank you so much, Thank you so much and practice, practice more and more chanting and you'll see everything else will change for the better. <laughs> Thank you, my answers. Hey, Krishna. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, thank you so much for your very, very wonderful class. Each line you spoke, uh, it's like a capsule of so much of uh, information and realizations. Uh, we have to hear it again and again. It's like uh, so much packed into one line. Thank you so much uh, for your wonderful association. Um, I had a question yesterday. Uh, we were discussing uh, with one devotee about uh, the material modes of nature and the mind. So he was asking that... Um, uh, what what is the material modes of nature exactly the definition and how the mind is uh, i mean connected to it or influenced by it and yeah. how this yeah. well the three modes goodness passion and ignorance according to the nature of the mind the mind will uh, attract a particular mode if your mind is in the if your mind is happy and engage in spiritual activities, you're attracting the mode of goodness. If you're, if you're engaged in activities for sense gratification or for economic gain, or for food of activities, you're attracting the mode of passion. And according to that attraction, those modes pull you into the activity. Like that. Mode also means Rope or guna, guna is another name for the word uh, uh, mode. It means guna. Guna also means rope. Rope means to bind. 
So these, these modes bind us to a certain type of activity and a certain way of thinking. If our mind is in the mode of ignorance, or excess, excessive sleep, or intoxication, or laziness, or just uh, destructive activities, then the mode of patent, mode of ignorance becomes prominent, and we become what we say very miserable. Mm -hmm. So the modes have certain characteristics and the, the nature of our mind, according to those activities and desires, attracts a particular type of mode and then we function accordingly by the power of that mode. Mode is like an energy, a force, it pulls you in that direction. So bring your mind to the mode of goodness by thinking spiritual thoughts like that. Thinking about how to serve the devotees that these are, this is activities of the mind in the mode of goodness. Okay. And which eventually when we practice the mind of the mode of goodness, after some time, we come to Suddha-sattva, pure goodness, or transcendental consciousness. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you for is your it, association. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. This is Gail. Mm -hmm. can, I just, can I just follow up on your answer to that question? Yeah. Um, let's see. Your voice is a little muffled. Oh. Huh. I don't know why. Is it still muffled? Uh, I think with the, way the, with the way the sound is coming through, if you speak very slowly, I can hear it. Okay. Yes, yeah, so a person who wants to serve the devotees, you said that person is in the mode of goodness. So why wouldn't, while he, while he is in that, while he is having that desire to serve the devotees, why wouldn't he, why wouldn't he be said to be in the transcendental Shuddha Sattva? Yeah, when when he when he's absorbed in that activity, then he's on he's on the pseudo sattva. If he has the desire, and then he's performing the desire, and he's still he's in the mode of goodness, moving towards the transcendental. So the qualities of transcendental and the qualities of goodness are practically the same. But the difference between transcendence is that one has is absorbed in service. One is absor absorbed in these qualities of the mode. They become pseudo-sattva, pure. So, you know, you have to elevate yourself out of the mode of passion and ignorance to the mode of goodness. And from the mode of goodness, you elevate yourself to the mode of transcendence. If you can stay in transcendence, then you are uh, on the liberated platform. You're on the transcendental platform. So um, we wouldn't. You you wouldn't you wouldn't normally go in and out of transcendental goodness, is it? We it sounds can. like it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, the activities are transcendental, but is the consciousness is the consciousness also transcendental or not? Mm. In other words, you might serve the devotees also, but you might also think of what you can get by serving the devotees. 
that's a mixed, mixed consciousness. If you're serving the devotees in order to please the devotees, then that's transcendental consciousness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm still grappling with the fact, not just to just not just now, but even before today, of the fact that a person can perform a transcendental activity even though their consciousness is not transcendental. You know, because normally I would think that the the consciousness is what determines the nature of the activity. It leads to that consciousness. Once the once it once the consciousness becomes absorbed in a purified state, then you're on the transcendental path. There's a verse in the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna says, Mam chayo vyapi charena bhakti yogena sevati sagunan samatitya itam brahmabhuya yakalpate. Can um, Mataji, was it Pavitra? Can you, can you bring up this verse? Uh, I, did, I believe it's 1426. Let's see if I'm right or not. Mam chayo vyapi charena bhakti yogena sevati. Let's see. Yeah, okay, there we go. One who engages in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material and later and comes through the Brahman platform of the spiritual platform. So one who has to engage in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, then you reach the transcendental platform. So that sounds like you can't be going in and out. You're going you in and be... out. You're, that's what you're doing. You're going in and out. You're getting some transcendental and then you're, you're going between the mode of goodness and the mode of transcendence like that. Or you and Russ also, you might also go into the mode of passion a little bit. Mm-hmm. He says full devotional service, not just devotional service. Then you're on the Brahman platform. Then you're on the Sutta Sattva platform. Yeah, so this also says unfailing in all circumstances, which sounds right. like you can't, you can't be going in and out. Well, once you practice and you know the art, then you can stay steady and bring your consciousness up to that, to that platform. This is something you have to in devotional service is, is practice. So that's an interesting purple. You can read the purple and give some ideas. Yeah, yeah what's this number again? 1426. <laughs> One fourteen twenty six? 1426 Gita. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. Okay. We hope you get there. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Maharaj, can I uh, piggyback on what, ask another question connected to what uh, the last speaker, Gail, was saying in the um, Bhava Gita? No, Shima Bhava, the 126. Survive from some parod harmo, that all but their hot city. A hoitiki apatiata, that unmotivated and uninterrupted. That would be on the Sutta Sattva platform, too. Yeah, that verse also illustrates this. Yeah, Yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect confirmation. Thank you. Unmotivated, uninterrupted. Yeah, which is why, this is why I'm saying that, you know, you can't, it seems like you cannot, you know, fluctuate between, you know, being on the transcendental platform and, and not, you know, to, to be considered, you know, pure devotion. It says uninterrupted, you know, so if you're fluctuating, then, then it's not, um, it seems like it's not on, not, you know, Shiva Sattva. 
Are you not there yet? Yeah. Yeah, just just be consistent. That's all. Just be consistent. That's what my heart is saying. Just be consistent. That's yeah. The mind of a person in transcendence cannot be understood. It is fixed on the lotus feet of the Lord in devotional service. It's not deviated in any circumstance. So, Maharaj, didn't you just say earlier that a person, you know, like we were using the example of somebody who wants to serve another devotee, you know, at the time that he becomes absorbed in that, he's in the, he's in the shooter sub platform. But, you know, the moment that he gets out of that, then he's no longer. Yeah, Prabhupada said that's the problem. He said it takes one minute to become purified. But then once you become purified, you go back to your old activities again. <laughs> then you're back down again. <laughs> you can be purified in one second if you just once chant the holy names of the Lord free from all motivation. In other words, once purely chanting Krishna's name, oh, everything, you're on the, you can reach the transcendental platform simply by that. But then what are you going to do the next moment? <laughs> That's why it's it's something that we have to practice constantly. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Maharaj, I have a uh, means one question, a backup question. Uh, it means uh, when we are not fully situated in transcendental position, I mean, so we should try to be in the mode of goodness, Maharaj, or we should just, and then slowly, gradually, we'll be raised in the transcendental position or directly engaging in the devotional service, we will be free. It means how it works. Yeah, that was, uh, that was Krishna's instructions to Arjun. He said, be situated in the mode of goodness. In other words, yeah, you have to practice those qualities of the mode of goodness. Humility, tolerance, pridelessness, uh, detachment <clears throat> from happiness and distress. In other words, we have to practice these qualities of the mode of goodness while we execute the activities of the devotional service at the same time. <clears throat> yeah, it requires that. And then once you get situated nicely in the mode of goodness, then it becomes what we say, and your activities will lead you to uh, becoming transcendental. Hmm. Or free from any, any tinge of material consciousness. And then what is the example of that? And then the activities reflect the nature of the personality of Godhead. One can experience the presence of the Lord through the spiritual activities. One can feel the Lord's presence. And sometimes when one is very developed, one can actually see Krishna. Mm -hmm. That is the actual goal. So we have to practice those modes of the the qualities of the mode of goodness. Thank you. Thank you, Madhya. This makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's why yeah. Prabhupada always uh, say you should try to come in the mode of goodness and then gradually you will raise in the transcendental position. It was very confusing for me always. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. What? Thank you. Thank you, Madhya. Hare Krishna. Oh, is our host still there? <laughs> Hi.
Hare Krishna. Yes, if no one has any questions now, we can end here. So thank you so much, Maharaj, for giving a valuable association in time. So thank you everyone for joining. So we can offer obeisances. Vancham kalpta rubeshya kripa sindhu imcha patita na paapne bhyo vishya vipyo namutma anand koti vishya vandhi ki jai. Shri la prabhupat ki jai. Jai. Smad bhagavatam ki jai. His holiness.